Also developing this hour, a small plane attempting to land at a private strip in Green Oak Township ended up crashing into some trees. Take a look at this. It happened just before one this afternoon at Eight Mile in Rushton. Now this is a landmark case. It's the first time a parent has been held criminally responsible for a mass shooting perpetrated by their child. Well, you know, Shana, anyone who's gotten behind the wheel of a car knows that feeling of being stuck at a red light. And luckily for us, researchers are working on ways to reduce those instances. And one of those ways is through changing traffic signals. A lot of people who maybe haven't been Lions fans mm -hmm. for the longest time, they might be jumping on the bandwagon. <laughs> are we okay with that? Do we want, is it the more the merrier or should it, you have suffered with us? Kelly, it beats the opposite where people were jumping off the bandwagon. <laughs> and New research from the University of Michigan shows pulse oximeters could misdiagnose black patients at risk of heart failure. As the ripple effects of the Flint water crisis continue, Michigan is dealing with a whole new slew of problems, managing one of the world's largest sources of fresh water. It's feeling fancy out here, Terrence. The red carpet just opened up, so we're expecting to see some prospects making their way here shortly. We're expecting to see 13 NFL hopefuls. They'll be walking this red carpet here, and it'll be, you know, those final moments when they go from college athlete to pro player. Rochelle Finkley can tell you that those three children sustained minor injuries. We're told they were actually in the home next to the explosion, and they received minor cuts and bruises from debris. Applying for jobs, it would say it's an entry level job, but we want you to have, you know, three years' experience. Should that discourage people from applying? Because I remember that feeling so frustrating. The Midwest is taking over the West Coast. How are we feeling? Yeah. Well, we're going to be bringing you everything happening tonight. We got the whole crew. Come on in, guys. Come on. In. We got the whole CBS Detroit crew here. Look at this crossover event. We got CBS morning, CBS evening. Luxury. Nice work. <laughs> Is yours? Yeah, yes, I got a raise. You didn't hear it? Oh, no. A World War II era shipwreck dating back more than 80 years has been discovered more than 600 feet below the surface of Lake Superior. Big rivalry game today, and despite the rainy weather, plenty of football fans showed out to support the Spartans and the Wolverines in East Lansing today. Now, the game was a blowout, with U of M winning 49 to 0. The biggest danger right now is from butane canisters. Officials say this facility had hundreds, if not thousands of these 10 to 15 pound canisters illegally on their property. Now, most of them did explode in the fire, but some remain undamaged and pressurized so they could still explode. Some landed in residents' yards. Others were picked up by people who wanted a souvenir from the explosion site. Now, if you have one, you must call the township to have it collected by the Michigan State Bomb Squad. So here was a danger piece right here. Marie Ainsworth was one of the many people in Clinton Township who wanted a part of the fire scene. And then here's a piece of the building where my collector. Before she knew about the dangers, she'd picked up one of those butane canisters. And you could still smell it. She collected it with plans to show her coworkers. And I did, until I got the phone call and all the notification. That can explode. I said, oh, I think I better leave. She then wanted to turn it over to officials and drove it to the scene of the fire very carefully. No, I'm serious. It was, I'm not taking this road because it's too bumpy. Easy on them brakes. Crews at the site, however, are not accepting canisters. She, like anyone else with one, must call the city and turn it over to the bomb squad. Please don't put yourself, your family, and your friends in jeopardy because those are dangerous. Clinton Township's mayor, Robert Cannon, says the facility was illegally storing the butane canisters. They were not permitted to have them in this building. They were illegally in that building. The building was last inspected in 2022. Since then, we've had one complaint on the property, and that had nothing to do with anything internal. It was for the storage of duck boats out in front of the business, which is in a violation of their site plan usage. The Clinton Township Fire Chief says their investigation will take time, and they're grateful for all the support they've received. I'm exceptionally proud of our people, the people that came in and helped from the other communities. Uh, so it's it's chaos, but it was controlled chaos. It has been nine years since the Flint water crisis began. Hey, there's floaties in this. But for some residents, they still feel like they are living in a science experiment. Great. Melissa Mays is the operations manager for Flint Rising, an organization trying to help those impacted after Flint's water was contaminated with lead in 2014. 
According to state testing, current lead levels in Flint's water have increased since the beginning of 2021, though they have remained below federal action levels for the past six and a half years. The city invested millions of dollars in improving their water infrastructure. We feed three different chemicals. Including this new chemical feed building, as well as reservoir renovations and adding a secondary water pipeline for emergencies. Despite all of this, the water plant supervisor, Scott Dungy, says many still don't trust it, even his own family. An uncle to this day still doesn't bathe, bathe in the water, and I've tried my best to, you know, so Scotty, I just don't trust it. You know what? I and so, Uncle Pete, I'm telling you, I can show you the records, and, and you have all new uh, copper line feeding your house and everything, and I've tested his water. Everything's great, but he's, he's still a little slow to come around, but someday I hope he will. Flint's mayor, Sheldon Neely, says it'll take time and work to earn back their trust. You know, in this community, when you think about kids of the age of six and under, has met, never drunk from their tap. Residents say a big step towards trusting their tap would be the replacement of all lead service lines, a requirement the city was given back in a 2017 settlement. It has been six years since the service line started to be replaced. The deadline pushed multiple times. When will this work finally be completed? It's less than 3% to complete that process, but the 3% that's remaining, majority of those are the ones who have not given us consent to go on their property to replace that, those lines. A federal judge has given Flint until August 1st to complete the work. The ruling stems from a lawsuit brought by Flint advocacy groups and residents, including Melissa Mays. We just want to be able to go to our taps and not be afraid of what that smell is. As the ripple effects of the Flint water crisis continue, Michigan is dealing with a whole new slew of problems, managing one of the world's largest sources of fresh water. A growing problem that's costing billions of dollars and costing lives is flooding. Brandon Wong is the CEO and co-founder of HiFi. They created a wireless solar powered sensor that uses sonar to monitor water levels. It's secure and then once that's installed, it's sending out the data. That data can be sent over the cellular network to city leaders, first responders, as well as home and business owners. Wong says the data can prevent emergencies and can help with long term planning. How do you plan your infrastructure? How do you design it? How do you size it up so that when you're getting more frequent storms and more intense storms, what should that look like? So this is the activity to carbon. So. Other water worries come from what damage can be done inside our bodies, like damage from PFAS or widely used long lasting chemicals sometimes found in water. They are called forever chemicals. Dr. Chihua Fan is a professor at Michigan State University. In his lab, they're developing technologies to trap and destroy PFAS, like with this plasma technology. Once bubbles are there, PFAS on the bubble will be destroyed by the plasma. Dr. Fan says PFAS is a global problem, but particularly important for Michigan and the Great Lakes region. Back in Flint, May says her family and others are dealing with the physical and mental health impacts from the crisis. But nine years in, they're still here and have no plans on backing down. They made the decisions to switch our water and to not treat it and to cover it up and hide it from people as innocent people died. Their job is to fix it and make our lives, our homes and our bodies right. There is one thing in Flint everyone can agree on, that what happened in their town should be a warning to all others with ailing water infrastructure. Reporting for CBS News Detroit, I'm Kelly Vaughn. You probably don't need federal inflation data to know that food is expensive right now. But the numbers do show it's becoming increasingly cheaper to hit the grocery store and eat at home rather than dining out. At Holiday Market in Royal Oak, many are choosing to do just that this Valentine's Day. Yeah, we try not to go out as much. I try to save here and there and shop around different stores. We still, we still treat ourselves when we, when we feel like going out, but not as much. The new Consumer Price Index data shows that the price of food at restaurants is up 5.1% year over year, while prices for groceries are up only 1.2%. Employees at Holiday Market say they have been busy the past few days with more and more people planning for a homemade Valentine's meal. Going out is a lot more expensive compared to years past. A Valentine's dinner now would be like 100 bucks compared to recent years when it was probably 40 or 50 bucks. 
And of course, wages haven't kept pace with those rising prices. Personal finance expert Lynette Calfani Cox says that dining out or eating in, not only are you paying more for food, you're often paying more for less. That same loaf of bread, for example, that might have had, you know, uh, you know, 25 slices in it now might have 20 slices in it. The reason for the increased food costs can be linked to many issues, including higher labor costs, record low cattle numbers, and companies hiking prices to boost their profits. When you change that death determination from a homicide to a suicide, number one, the first thing that happens is the investigation stops, completely stops. <laughs> On September 21st, 2021, Detroit police responded to this 911 call. My, my cousin just shot himself. 21-year-old Isaiah White was dead, a gunshot wound to the head. I was playing the game and I just heard a big boom. Police body camera footage of the night shows the 911 caller and the caller's family talking to law enforcement about White's mental health, saying he had dealt with depression and self-harm in the past. He was quiet. Quiet. He's a quiet boy. Okay. When White's parents got the call, they say they were in shock. He had just spoken with them that day, asking for help paying his rent. Who would, you know, try to make arrangements to pay their rent? the same day and then later on that night kill themselves. So it just was not, um, I was not accepting what happened to him. That might not be a suicide. At the scene, police also start to raise questions. Well, the off the, the gun. Right. Yeah, and something. then where he shot. Officers say before the single gunshot, White appeared to have been on the couch smoking and watching TV. They discussed the shotgun that was used, questioning if someone could use it one-handed to shoot the back of their head. In the medical examiner's report, it is said the manner of death has to be homicide. It was clear as day. We went through the report to see for ourselves. In it, the chief medical examiner writes that the investigation revealed the decedent could not have shot himself in the back of the head with the shotgun in question and only using his left hand. Thus, the manner of death is homicide. White's death certificate also says homicide. After his funeral, White's mother began requesting police documents and medical records, and that's when they found this, a new addendum to the coroner's report dated nearly two months after the shooting. It changed White's death from a homicide to a suicide. White's family says they were never told about the change. The report states that blood pattern analysis revealed White could have shot himself with his non-dominant hand. It also cites White's past suicidal ideations. I mean, we all have mental health issues at times. Does that mean that he doesn't get a fair investigation? We reached out to the University of Michigan, which was operating the medical examiner's office at the time of the allegations. The university said it cannot respond to our questions as they involve pending litigation. There's a bigger picture here. Attorney Dion Webster Cox represents the families in the lawsuit. She says a death determination change has ripple effects. And now you get to report and say, our numbers have gotten better. And it's not just White's case. Kanisha Coleman was shot in the abdomen in July 2020. Her death was ruled a homicide, then months later switched to suicide. He said we went by witness statements and polygraph tests. And later on, I found out that the suspects had been changed to witnesses and that her cause of death had been changed from a homicide to suicide. Her family member wants to hide her identity because she says she feels Coleman's killer is still out there and she doesn't know who she can trust. Webster Cox says in both cases, the scientific evidence did not support changing the death determinations. So a right-handed person shoots himself in the back of the head with the left hand and it's a shotgun along 19 inches. That, how does that happen? Make it make sense for me and I'll leave it alone. The family say they feel like collateral damage in a system that doesn't care about them or their loved ones. But because it was a young black male, appeared to be all alone, they didn't know that he had a family that was willing to fight for him. They felt they could just push his life under the rug as if he never existed. And we can't live with that. A serene morning fishing on the Detroit River. Holy cow. 
but there's plenty more than fish in these waters. <laughs> what is it? It's a big pipe wrench in a chain. Jason Vanderwall started Motor City Magnet Fishers as a pandemic hobby, a way to get outside with his daughter and help clean up the environment. I never realized how much garbage is at the bottom of our waterways. Now, 60 bicycles, a few motorcycles, and hundreds of thousands of social media followers later, the Motor City Magnet Fishers are still surprised by what they find. I hated the regular fishing. For Randy Burns, instead of waiting all day for a fish to bite, he'd rather pull out toxic e-scooter batteries, hundreds of feet of fishing line, and even a few pipe bombs. Uh, the history really drives me in the uh, idea of where you came from. You know, what, what's the story behind what we just pulled up? Magnet fishing involves throwing a powerful magnet into the water, dragging it across the bottom, and seeing what you pull up. They let me have a try. You got something on there. Oh, careful, careful, careful. What? Uh, it's a big knife. It's a big knife. Oh, gosh. Oh, my God, you got a gun, too. <laughs> In that one throw, we pulled handcuffs, a very old revolver, and a large hunting knife. They found nearly 100 firearms magnet fishing in Michigan. A few weeks ago in Lansing, they even found one police dive teams were actively searching for. Oh, I like it. That might be the one we're looking for. Whenever they find a gun, they call law enforcement and turn it over. We'll take that off your hands. Throughout our morning, we found plenty of other gun parts. It's like a shotgun barrel. That's a slide to a gun. Clock nine millimeter. It's a magazine. <laughs> we also pulled out old keys, railroad spikes, tools, and even a pager. It's that feeling of uncovering a mystery that has helped spread magnet fishing around the world. But this is a particularly great spot. Oh, Detroit absolutely is. There's a lot of history in this water. <laughs> I got the luck today. Sure Hundreds of years of history buried on top of each other. They have found a mortar round from World War II and this porcelain sign from the 40s, which is the only find they've ever sold. I sold it for $350. It was actually estimated to be worth about $650, but the gentleman who purchased it from me was a sign collector. I knew it was going to a good home and it wasn't just going to be resold for profit. Put your foot on the wrench or you can do it that way too. Beautiful wrench, <laughs> if anyone's in need and some pliers. That's awesome. Awesome. Good job. See, now you're getting an idea for how much crap there actually is at the bottom of the river. But some of their finds can be disturbing. Oh my God. GoPro, start recording. No, don't, don't. We found a dog. Uh, somebody had drowned him. That was the second dog we found in that park. And both days, you know, you just, you go, you go home with your head hung low, you feel bad, and you, you lose a lot of faith in humanity. But they keep coming back for the good, cleaning up our waterways, helping a kayaker recover their lost keys, and finding those secrets hidden just beneath us. Nice catch. Nice catch. I can join the team now? Yeah, yeah, you're on the team.